Hello and welcome to uh, our introductory lecture to Hinduism. So uh, just to let you know, uh, this, in, this lecture includes two sets of PowerPoints, both of which are quite extensive as they, I use them in multiple classes. Um, so I encourage you to take a look through them on your own. Uh, there are a number of slides that I have skipped over for the sake of this course, but uh, feel free to, to look at any and all of the content that I've provided. I'm not going to go through every slide, so I'm going to highlight a few things that I think are a little bit more uh, challenging to understand and um, that will tie in a lot of the concepts that are more thoroughly discussed in the lectures themselves. So make sure to take a look at those on your own. So to start us off, um, I want to point out that this is the first of our major world religions that we're going to be looking at after Zoroastrianism, which we covered last week. And so uh, we've already discussed the differences between indigenous traditions and major world religions. Now I want to uh, classify the major world religions into two subcategories, those which are considered Eastern religious traditions and those that are considered Western religious traditions. So for the sake of our course, the Western religious traditions will include will uh, be constitutive of the Abrahamic religious traditions. So um, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and then some of the offshoots uh, later on in newer religious traditions, whereas the other traditions that we'll be covering are the Eastern religious traditions. And not only will we be going through those um, in those categories, but also in chronological order. So we're going to be covering the oldest of these traditions first, and then moving forward in time so we can understand how the ideas have evolved from the traditions that came before it. And so this uh, lecture will constitute the beginning or the first of our Eastern religious traditions that we're going to be taking a look at, whereas Zoroastrianism is really a precursor to the Western religious traditions that we'll see later on. Although there will be some uh, concepts which are carried over in Hindu polytheism, which we'll see in a minute, but for the sake of this class, this is the first of the Eastern religious traditions we'll be taking a glance at. And so just to give you a general sense of how Eastern religions kind of overall compare to the Western religions, again, these are generalizations, right? They apply in most cases, there might be some exceptions and we'll talk about those, but on the whole, right, we have some general characteristics that classify Western religious traditions as compared to Eastern religious traditions. And I think some of the major ones to point out are that Eastern traditions tend to be more focused on how to improve the life that we're living in now. So that is the current realm of existence on, on this planet, right, or in the physical universe. Whereas Western traditions tend to, if, you know, if and when they talk about um, how we should behave in this realm or in this universe, it's really as an instrumental purpose towards some conception of the afterlife or something that comes later on, right, a, a separate dimension. And we'll get a little bit of that in Hinduism, but for the most part, Eastern traditions are really sort of pragmatic in the sense that they are their main goal is to end suffering on earth. That is kind of the be all end all and final purpose of every sort of path to enlightenment that we're gonna see from these Eastern traditions. Another thing that sort of captures uh, a distinction between these two is views on knowledge or in philosophy, uh, we call that epistemology. And in the West, we'll notice trends where knowledge is considered something that is very plausible for humans to, to achieve, right? And so, um, you know, when we engage in philosophical or theological questioning, the goal is to achieve some knowledge that is possible, whether that be um, knowledge, you know, from our existence, from sacred texts, from spiritual paths, or from the divine itself. It is knowledge that we are capable of achieving. Whereas Eastern traditions are a little bit more willing to embrace a sort of skepticism about knowledge, the idea that some, if not all, knowledge might actually be impossible for us to achieve. And so that's going to play a, a very interesting role in how one achieves enlightenment, union with the divine, right, whatever the goal is in that religion, knowledge might not be the, the key to, to achieving that end. Um, the other primary distinction that we'll see is, again, something um, that was highlighted when we discussed indigenous religious traditions, and that is the way they approach metaphysics, right? So we're going to see a very dualistic approach in the West where all concepts are seen as having, you know, two opposing forces, right? Good and evil, right? Heaven and hell, these types of things. Whereas in the East, we're going to see more of a monistic approach to the nature of reality, where all things are part of one ultimate reality or the concepts themselves, once we truly understand them, are in fact indistinguishable from each other. And so we'll see how that plays out in the different traditions as we go through them. 
So to introduce Hinduism, right, this much like indigenous traditions that came before it, doesn't necessarily tell us exactly what someone believes if they were a practitioner of this tradition. It is instead a very large umbrella term which captures a set of religious ideas which in this case are associated with a particular geographical region that is the Indra, uh, Indus River, right, in um, uh, sort of central western India, right, a little bit to the north, or a particular set of religious writings, right? So you could either associate yourself with Hinduism as being part of a religious tradition that began in this part of the world, or because you follow a set of teachings that came from a specific set of texts, which we'll see in a moment. So Hinduism, again, as a large umbrella term, is not necessarily what someone who follows that tradition in various parts of the world might call it. Often, instead, this this religion or this uh, set of practices or beliefs is called Sanatana Dharma. So Dharma is going to be a word that we're going to see a lot in Eastern religions, and this has to do with one's duty, right? And so the duty in this case is going to be following, again, a certain path as it is set forth in a set of texts or a certain set, uh, text that one is adhering to. Um, so we're going to see this in Hinduism as well as in Buddhism, since Buddhism is going to be something that comes out of the Hindu tradition. So Hinduism, again, is uh, considered one of the oldest living religions, again, after Zoroastrianism, but it is much larger in that um, not only is it just as old, if not older, but it has a far larger set of practitioners, right? Zoroastrianism um, is, is unfortunately a dying religion. We don't see as many people practicing that religion in the world today, whereas Hinduism is very widely practiced all over the world. So one of the interesting things about Hinduism is that we're not exactly sure how old it is. And this has to do with the oldest set of texts that are considered sacred in Hinduism being so difficult to determine their origins that the actual practitioners of Hinduism see them as eternal, right? They think that they always existed or that this religious tradition itself always existed, right? So because of it, the uh, mysteriousness around its origins, it's taken on a sort of higher sacred status. So from what we can tell, we're, this tradition is anywhere from 3,500 to 5,000 years old, if not older. And the primary texts in this tradition are written in Sanskrit, which is the oldest written language, right, outside of the pictographic uh, languages which accompany it. So speaking of its large uh, population of adherents, it's over, uh, the last estimates were over 1.15 billion people. That's about 15 to 16 percent of the entire world's population identify as some form of, uh, as following some form of Hinduism. So a follower of Hinduism, right, whether they call it Hinduism or Sanatana Dharma, is typically referred to as a Hindu, and this again is representative of the geographical origins of the tradition in the Indus River, or the term in Sanskrit is Sindhu, and we get Hindu from this. So because the oldest set of the texts in Hinduism are considered eternal, right, having always existed, Hinduism is unique from a lot of the other traditions in that it doesn't have um, a founder or any single sort of origin story, right? So the idea is that, again, that perhaps this tradition always existed, right, was always the case, didn't have a beginning or is in some sense timeless. So with that, I wanted to give you a brief sort of uh, view, overview of the historical period that we're going to be looking at because as I mentioned, Hinduism has been around for a very, very, very long time, right? The oldest that we can date back is at most to 3,500 years, right? And most of the empirical evidence we have is um, even newer than that. And so we're going to be moving from what is the earliest uh, empirically studied aspects of the tradition just through some of its major sacred texts, but not so much into the modern um, or contemporary versions, which, again, as religions evolve, they become more and more diverse. So we can sort of think of it as, again, an umbrella term, where as time goes on, they're going to be more and more branches of this tradition, and they'll differ in more and more degrees. So going back, um, we're going to talk about the first set of sacred texts, which, again, are considered eternal, right, without authorship, and those are called the Vedas. So the Vedic texts, or what is in this time classified as the Vedic period, right, those were the sacred texts of the time, 
mostly constituted uh, ritual worship, right? So it was more a set of um, guidelines in how to pra practice or perform certain rituals, and then of course what the purposes of those rituals were. Now, even though the Vedic texts predate the 1700 mark that we have in front of us, this Vedic period really became um, more widely practiced or sort of institutionalized because of a certain caste of individuals known as the Brahmins. So prior to the Vedic period, even though the Vedic texts existed, they were mostly practiced or studied by individuals on their own. There was no sort of central location of worship at this time. But when the Brahmins came into a position of authority or leadership, they uh, did what many religious institutions do, which is to give themselves a primary role in understanding and practicing the religious tradition, meaning that they were, you know, communicating a message that, you know, in order to practice the rituals correctly, you shouldn't do it on your own in your homes. You should come to them, right, get guidance, make sure you're doing it the right way. And they, of course, had the knowledge of, uh, to ensure that that was the case. One of the important things about this period is not only does it become one of the main institutionalizing moments in Hinduism, but it's also the same group of people that created the caste system. So this is important because we will see the caste system referenced in later Hindu texts, but it's not in the Vedas, right? So it's something that was sort of created outside of the religious tradition and then sort of becomes adopted or absorbed as the religion evolves later on. So one of the things that we're gonna learn about the Vedas is that um, there are a number of them, and each one of them is broken up into four parts. And the first three parts had to do with different types of rituals, right? Uh, different aspects of life. The fourth part of each Veda though, is the part that is known as the Upanishads. And the Upanishads were really just the philosophical questions that perhaps arise out of the rituals that were discussed in those texts, right? So if we have rituals that cover, you know, the end of life and um, views of the afterlife, then the philosophical questions at the end would be about the nature of the reality we're in now and then whatever the nature is of the afterlife. And so we'll get a sense of what those questions are. But it, around the 1500s, before the Common Era, we leave the Vedic period and enter what is called the pre-epic period. And this is a time when the ritual components of the Vedic texts tend to be less highlighted and more of a focus is placed on the Upanishads, right? So we start to see a, a greater development of the Hindu philosophy at this time, really just focusing on this fourth part of the Vedas, the end of the Vedas, which is often treated as if it's its own set of texts. But just to be clear, the Upanishads are part of the Vedas. They are just the last part of each Veda, which compo are composed of their philosophical questions. And typically, again, if we have these priests who are considered authority figures, those priests who were able to attain a sort of mystical status or an enlightened experience would be said to have had the answers to some of these philosophical questions. And so that's when we move forward quite a bit here now um, into the 800 before the Common Era into the Epic period. And this brings about a new set of texts, um, again, a very large epic poem known as the Mahabharata. But uh, while the Mahabharata is the, the longest poem ever written, one part of that story, one part of that epic poem is probably the most famous text in Hinduism, and that is known as the Bhagavad Gita, which I'll talk about in the second part of this lecture. But that is a separate text from the Vedas and the Upanishads, right? So a separate text, which has, in many cases, very different metaphysical uh, conceptions of reality in it, very different ideas uh, as they are related to the caste system, right? It's more deeply ingrained at this time. And so we sort of just see it uh, presumed as a state of things and then sort of reinforced as they discuss elements of the soul and karma and elements of reincarnation. Moving forward, we're not going to uh, get into this in our class, but just so you know, following the epic period, we enter into the great systems period, still 500 years before the common era, which is where we get the very famous Vedanta sutras, right? So the sutras are going to be, uh, this is just a name for threads, so additional elements of knowledge and uh, questions and answers that are, are discovered. This is where 
the philosophy of the religious tradition starts to branch off into other areas of uh, human life, like politics, even love. So the very famous uh, karma or Kama Sutra, right, would be under this class, right? So different ways of getting a deeper understanding of how we can live our lives such that we can attain enlightenment. Then we move into the common era, right? The medieval Renaissance, theology continues, as well as into the 1800s with the modern period and further commentaries on the sacred texts. So we're gonna be focusing on the first three sacred texts here, the Vedas, the Upanishads, which again are a subset of the Vedic texts, and then the Bhagavad Gita, which is part of an epic poem known as the Mahabharata. So here's again, uh, just another uh, deeper clarification of these texts. Feel free to take a look at this as well as uh, some information about other common texts that are very prominent in the tradition. Okay, so one of the elements of the cosmology or the view of the nature of reality, the study of the cosmos, right, the study of the universe in Hinduism, is an interesting type of what that is called qualified dualism. And so as I mentioned earlier, Eastern traditions, of which Hinduism is considered a part, one of them, are typically classified by monistic metaphysics, meaning that everything is part of one reality. So qualified dualism is gonna capture the fact that although everything is part of one reality, we don't recognize that, right? Human beings um, exist in such a way that we mistake the one unified whole to actually be composed of two halves. And so given that we're under this mistaken conception of reality, we have to talk about and name those two things that we think exist. And so that's why it's quote unquote qualified dualism. So there are two things only because we mistake the universe for having two components. And ideally, right, when we achieve enlightenment, we wanna move beyond that dualistic conception into a more monistic understanding. So this is going to be tied um, most clearly to pantheism, which I defined earlier in our introduction to religion. So that is the idea that again, everything is part of one whole, right? And that God or the divine permeates that entire reality and everything within it. But then again, there is a, a subset within that ultimate reality, which we exist in and which we mistake as being separate from the divine. And so here again, we're going to see an element of skepticism that's going to permeate uh, this as well as other Eastern traditions, where even though we're gonna use language to talk as if there are two realities, right? That's really not conveying the truth of the matter, right? It's just a tool to help us describe our misunderstanding so that we can then move beyond it. And so with that, I'm gonna focus on um, a little drawing that I've, uh, drawing, I would normally draw this in a face-to-face -face class, but a little diagram that I've put together to help us understand all of the components that are later covered in this lecture, but to get a sense of how they work together. So starting from the outset, again, if we were to conceive of all of reality, we could just draw a big circle, right? Everything that exists, exists as part of one unified reality. And that reality, in Hinduism is called Brahman. Now this is very similar to some other words that we'll see. We saw Brahmins earlier with an I, that was for the priests. Later on, you'll also see the word Brahma, which is one of the three main components of Brahman or uh, tasks, which is known as the Trimurti, right? So these are three components of Brahman. But Brahman itself written this way is the ultimate reality. So this is meant to convey something like a sense of the divine. Um, some, we could call it God, but it's not personalized in the way that we normally consider a God to be. So Brahman is everything. Brahman is unchanging. Brahman is eternal, right? So Brahman has always existed and always will exist. Now, if you're familiar with um, any ancient Western uh, Greek philosophy like uh, Plato, this would be most similar to uh, his conception of the intelligible realm, right? So this is something that is beyond our experience that is more true than the types of things that we understand in the world. And so with that, we have to separate, again, this sort of qualified dualism. We have to separate the ultimate reality in which everything is housed from 
what we mistakenly think is reality. And that in Hinduism, as well as what we'll see in Buddhism, is called Maya. And so Maya refers to the aspects of reality that we can experience through the five senses, which of course is a very limited set of th concepts. And because we mistake our physical experiences for being the most real, right, this is why it's an illusion. And the idea here is that the reason things in our physical experience can't be the most true is because unlike Brahman, everything in Maya is constantly changing, right? Everything is either coming into existence, when it exists, it's undergoing change, right? We understand this now through uh, decomposition, right? So everything is breaking down, changing form over time, and eventually everything in the physical world will cease to exist. And so because everything in our physical experience is changing all the time, it is temporary. And traditionally, things that are temporary cannot be considered ultimate truths, like say, mathematics, right? Two plus two will always equal four. Whereas any truth I make about the world around me or any uh, statement I make about the world around me, even if it is true at the moment, at some point, earlier on in existence, it wasn't true. And at some point in the future, it won't be true. And the same can be said of ourselves, right? Anything that you would say about yourself, right? Wasn't true before you existed. Even perhaps at certain times of your life, it depends on what's going on with you, whether or not that's true. And in the future, it will no longer be true. And so because of that, anything that we consider knowledge in Maya is not actually knowledge. And so that's the illusion that we're under we think of our physical experiences as being the most true when in fact they are considered the least true things as opposed to those uh, concepts related to brahman right or this like if we're using platonic knowledge the intelligible realm where things are always true right they will never change they will never go out of being they always have existed so because brahman is the ultimate reality Brahman is infinite and encompasses everything. And so that can make discussing or describing Brahman very difficult for the human mind to comprehend and also just pragmatically, right? If we wanna talk about a certain component of Brahman, right? Just using that word is not gonna really help us because it captures everything. And so what we're gonna see is um, a, a first distinction that we're gonna make here between the ultimate reality and then the part of Brahman that is in you. And this is gonna constitute the conception of the soul in Hinduism, okay? So Brahman is seen as conceptually distinct from, but identical with the term Atman. So if we were to consider Brahman, um, I think a good metaphor is like um, air, or uh, let's start with this, uh, an infinite puzzle, okay? So imagine an infinite puzzle, that is Brahman. Each puzzle piece, right, would be Atman, and those puzzle pieces are only temporarily manifested in Maya. So that's like the soul, right, temporarily existing in this physical world. But because our true selves are all part of Brahman, this conception of the soul is very different from what we see in Western traditions because all of us will have the identical soul, right? All of us have the same Atman. And so this is one of the things that we're, we are mistaken of in Maya. We think we're all separate individuals. We think we're all uh, different, disconnected from each other when the true reality, the true fact of the matter in Hinduism is that there is a part of ourselves that is not temporary, right? That is eternal. And that comes from Brahman, but that doesn't mean that we're God, right? We're not all of Brahman. So Atman refers to just the part of Brahman that is in you. And so that is considered to be your true self. Okay, so Atman again is considered one and the same as Brahman, but like a broken puzzle, each of those pieces is temporarily housed in Maya in a different physical form. And those physical forms exist not just in a single lifetime, but in a cycle of death and rebirth, or something that we would probably most understand as reincarnation. And this cycle of death and rebirth is considered, is believed to go on forever, right, in Maya, because again, it's part of Brahman. So in this cycle, right, Atman is temporarily housed in a body, 
that body, while it exists, if it is a human being, will engage in certain actions, and those actions will have consequences, right? Those, if those actions are good, they will bring about good consequences. If those actions are bad, they will bring about bad consequences. And even though the individual in that lifetime might not experience the consequences of their own actions, they will accumulate what we understand as karma, right? So these are like cosmic points through which, right, as we accumulate these karmic points throughout our lifetime, that will determine what our next cycle of re in reincarnation will be like. So when your um, Atman is housed in a body, it's going to be under the illusion of Maya, and so it's going to think that it's distinct, right? You think you are a, a separate, unique individual. And because we are under that illusion in Maya, we will take on individual personality traits, which are often tied to karma that we have accumulated in a previous life, right? So if someone, um, you know, did a lot of bad things in a previous life, they might have um, a very chaotic personality, right? Which will cause them to endure a lot of suffering in that lifetime. And so we can think of, again, here, our Atman, as being like the true self deep, deep down. Uh, if you consider it like another analogy would be like a coat rack, right? Your, your Atman is the same throughout every cycle of reincarnation, but depending on which body it's in, it's like putting a different coat on the coat rack, right? So your Atman will take on a certain personality in this life. And then depending on the karma that you accumulate, that Atman will shred its Jiva go through the cycle of death and rebirth, and when it's reborn, depending on what it's reborn as, will accumulate or put on a different jiva, right? So, you know, if I do bad things in this life, maybe I will be reborn as a cat, right? So my Atman, in a human form now, would transfer to the cat, but my personality, my jiva, would not, right? It might create the foundation of the next life, but it will depend on the karma that I've accumulated as to what that cat's life would be like. And typically being reborn as, as an animal, as much fun as that might seem, is actually considered a lower form of reincarnation and typically signifies that you did something uh, problematic in a previous life. So there are a number of different uh, realms or uh, things that one can be reborn as. But again, the idea is that all of these living things have an Atman. They're just temporarily taking on different personalities in different lifetimes and, you know, moving through the cycle of samsara. So what is the point of all of this? Well, even though we could be reborn in a better life, right? So let's say you do a lot of really wonderful things and you think, okay, cool, maybe I'll be reborn as someone who's really rich and wealthy in the next life. While that might be nice and might uh, lessen your suffering, that's actually not the goal. The goal is not to just g earn good karma and be reborn as something better in the next life. Because when we are in the cycle of samsara in Maya, this is a sign that we have still, we've, we're still not grasping the ultimate reality. We haven't learned what we've needed to learn. And specifically, what we are ignorant of, if we are in Maya, is that we are ignorant of our true selves, right? So anyone who is born, anyone who exists in samsara, the fact that you still exist in samsara is a sign that you suffer from this ignorance, which is called avidya, right? And this is what we need to overcome. So again, the goal in Hinduism is not simply to be reborn as something better, but to actually shred this illusion of an individual self and gain true understanding or knowledge of the fact that we all share an Atman and that Atman is one and the same as Brahman, right? And so the goal is to actually break from this cycle of samsara by understanding that. And this, uh, oh, sorry, I'll come back to that in a second. But this break is known as moksha. This is the ultimate goal in Hinduism, right? It's considered a form of spiritual liberation or enlightenment. 
and it means that you will no longer be reborn in Maya and you will be reabsorbed into Brahman. So again, thinking like that puzzle piece is going to rejoin Brahman. Now, why wouldn't you want to just stay in Maya and be reborn in better and better ways? Well, one of the components or uh, you know temporary truths of Maya is, like I mentioned before, something that all Eastern religions really embrace, which is that physical existence of any form involves suffering. Now, that doesn't mean that we're suffering all the time, but it means that you cannot exist in the physical world without suffering at some point. And so the goal is to leave samsara so that you will no longer suffer. And when you rejoin Brahman, you will be part of that ultimate reality, which is also described as being a state of bliss, right? So being relieved from any form of suffering. Now, uh, going back to the, the little diagram up at the top here, is that one of the things I mentioned before is that because Brahman is infinite, Brahman is not something that is easy for us to sort of wrap our minds around, right? So if we're trying to overcome avidya, this ignorance of our true selves, that can be difficult to do if you're trying to identify with something that is disembodied, something that is infinite, something that is eternal, right? The mind may not be able to comprehend, let alone form a relationship with a, that type of being, making moksha very difficult to accomplish. And so one of the interesting uh, forms of divinity that we see in Hinduism is both pantheism as well as polytheism. And then later on, in um, uh, specifically in the Bhagavad Gita, we're going to see an emphasis on monotheism, focusing on one particular god uh, that is associated with Brahman. But the idea is that if Brahman is infinite, well, then Brahman encompasses all different types of characteristics, all different things that we can give names to, um, all different physical forms, right? Everything is embodied within Brahman. And so because of that, in Hinduism, the idea is that you cannot form a relationship with the eternal itself, so we will give names and faces and personalities to the different personalities or characteristics of Brahman. And so if you have, you know, maybe you have a problem relating with a masculine conception of the divine, right, then there are feminine conceptions of the divine to be found, and you can form a relationship with them. Um, I know that this has come up as well as we'll, we'll see in uh, Christianity. Perhaps you have difficulty uh, relating to a white god, right, or um, a, a god that doesn't look like you. Well, then there is a god out there in the pantheon of Hindu polytheism for you. There are even non-human gods or gods that, um, you know, are outside of the gender binary, right, that have both masculine and feminine characteristics or characteristics of certain animals, right? So the idea is that there are thousands, if not millions, of different conceptions of Brahman. And again, none of these on their own are Brahman in its entirety, but it's one component of the infinite that will make a relationship a little bit more plausible for you. And there's something, again, very practical in allowing the individual to follow or form a relationship with a form of the divine that works best for them. And so um, of the, the thousands and millions of different conceptions of the divine that we find in Hinduism, there are going to be some that are, are particularly important for us to focus on. And so that should be coming up next. So again, take a look here at um, uh, some more descriptions of the cosmology. Here again, descriptions of Brahman and the different conceptions of God that we find in the different texts. I want to go here now. All right, so we were just talking about uh, polytheism as it relates to Brahman. And this is discussed more in the Upanishads, right? So those philosophical questions at the end of the Veda. That again, there are many different aspects to Brahman, but there are traditionally three primary aspects, characteristics, or tasks that Brahman is attributed with, right? That are going to be considered some of the most important things that Brahman does in the universe. And so try here means three, right? So these are the three components of Brahman. Shiva... Vishnu and Brahma. Shiva is considered to be the god of destruction 
and recreation. So sometimes people just associate Shiva with destruction. But the point is in samsara that things are not just destroyed, but again, recreated, right? It's an infinite cycle. So Shiva is considered the god of destruction and recreation. Vishnu is the god of preservation. So while something exists, right, and that they want to preserve that life, right, Vishnu would be the god to focus on there. And so because of that, we're going to see Vishnu as being the prime aspect of the Trimurti, which is emphasized in the later text, the Bhagavad Gita, which is then embodied in the form of Krishna, right? So that's the human form that Vishnu takes in that text. Vishnu is said to have taken, I think, 10 or 11 different forms or avatars uh, throughout the history of Hinduism. And so Krishna is one of them. And so you'll see in the later forms of Hinduism, a focus on that particular God, right? Just worshiping Krishna which, or, or Vishnu. And then the third uh, task is Brahma. So again, very similar to Brahman and Brahman, but Brahma is the god of creation. So that initial creation. Okay, and so it's believed that we can understand, right, come to know God or God can reveal itself in a number of different ways, right? So there is, of course, direct appearance to liberated souls. So when someone achieves moksha, they are no longer reborn in samsara, right? So they've left maya. It's not like they, you know, just drop dead or anything like that. But when the physical body no longer exists, their atman will not be reborn in samsara. Again, instead, it will rejoin Brahman. And the idea is that when that happens, of course, you would be one with Brahman, and so you would be able to experience Brahman in its entirety. Another way, of course, that God could reveal itself is through accumulating knowledge in Maya. And that's something that you'll see is going to be reserved for only a specific cast of individuals who are um, considered the authorities. And so you can already guess that's going to be the Brahmins caste, right? So the, the, who were the priests. But this is the highest caste, which is, tends to be reserved uh, only for males. Um, there's a lot to be said about that, but we'll, we'll set that aside for the moment. Um, but there is a certain amount of knowledge that we can accumulate, right, to overcome our avidya, which is necessary for achieving moksha. There is the idea that we can come to understand God through Brahma's work, right, through the act of creation, learning from the um, embodiment, right, the incarnations that Vishnu has taken, again, as seen as uh, in 10 avatars. One of the interesting things is that Vishnu is not only believed to have been um, incarnated in Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, as we'll see, but it's also believed because uh, Buddhism sprang from Hinduism that Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, was actually just an incarnation of Vishnu, right? So that's how Hindus perceive uh, Buddhism, right? As being a, a subsect of their religious tradition. And the Buddha, the first Buddha, was just an incarnation of Vishnu, right? There is the idea of searching inward, which is why we're going to see um, a heavy focus on yogic yoga practice in the Hindu tradition, right? Looking inwards to, again, uh, perhaps gain a, a different sort of knowledge, right? More of an experiential knowledge or feeling. And then, as is very distinct from the Western religions, where it is uh, considered sacrosanct to create any image of the divine, in Hinduism, it's actually very important, right? So the, the idea of putting a form, a face, a personality, a name on God is necessary for us to create a relationship with that God. And so the, the images themselves can help us to focus, right, and further ourselves along on the path to enlightenment. All right, so uh, with that, I want to go back just one slide before I forget to talk about some of the different um, forms of ethics or moral codes that we find in Hinduism. So because Hinduism is such a vast tradition, we're going to find a number of different normative ethical theories, right? So this is something that we would cover in more depth in an introduction to philosophy class. You don't need to know all of these, you know, specifically. Um, one that's going to come back around in a big way is the negative golden rule, which we'll see in Confucianism. And then, of course, notions of divine command theory, which are going to be very uh, heavily leaned upon in the Abrahamic traditions. But the main point here is that because 
Hinduism thinks that it's, it's, it's very inclusive in its view of enlightenment, right? There are many different paths to the divine. And so because of that, there are, there's room for a lot of different conceptions of right and wrong. So just to understand that there's a great variety of, of beliefs within this tradition. And these are just some of the main ones that are discussed in some of the ancient texts. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to Brahman here and just introduce uh, some other concepts or names that you might see come up to describe Brahman, right? Because again, Brahman is infinite. It's why we have polytheism. It's why we have the Trimurti. It's why we have all of these different names and entities. And so there's another main way of separating different aspects of Brahman. And that is Nirguna Brahman from Saguna Brahman. So Nirguna Brahman is going to be the parts of Brahman that we really can't describe, right? That um, are just without any physical attributes, right? Maybe it's just beyond our language or beyond um, our, our, our ability to comprehend. So there is a part of Brahman that will always be unknowable, unspeakable, right, in, to a certain extent. And so we capture that, uh, that component or those aspects of Brahman by the concept of Nirguna Brahman. And so this is to say, right, when we describe Nirguna Brahman, what we're saying is just neti neti. Nirguna Brahman is not this, it's not that. It's really nothing that we could put a name or a description to. As opposed with Saguna Brahman, right, those are the aspects of Brahman that we can describe, right? And so the those aspects can be described in lots of different ways, right, again, with all of the different forms of polytheism. But what is primarily said of Saguna Brahman is Sat Chit Ananda, okay? So Brahman is being, right, existence in, in a sense, consciousness, right, so associating it with the rational mind, and bliss, right? So that is to capture that sentiment, that lack of suffering that we experience in Maya. Now, this is something that I mentioned in our um, lecture for Zoroastrianism, so it's worth noting again that because of this conception of Brahman as the ultimate reality composing of all things, Brahman itself is actually considered to be beyond good and evil, right? Good and evil are going to be seen as mistaken distinctions that only exist in Maya. And so because of that, the notion of Brahman or any of the polytheistic forms of the divine associated with it don't suffer from the philosophical problem of evil. All right, so uh, we talked about Atman as it relates to Jiva in Avidya. And so with that, I wanna spend a little time talking to you about the caste system, which I mentioned earlier. So again, this is something that was instituted by the Brahmins, right, those priests. So it does not appear in the Vedic texts, but does appear in the Bhagavad Gita and texts further on because it was so deeply entrenched in society at that time. Now, uh, the caste system has come under a lot of scrutiny. It was something that um, really started to influence the way people were treated uh, in when we had uh, British colonialism in India, right? So it sort of got worse. Um, and then it started to get a little better after that, um, after India uh, achieved you know, its independence and so forth. So there were actually before, the, this is more representative of the current caste system, there used to be a fifth caste, which was the lowest, and those were considered the untouchables. Um, and so it was the, these individuals were treated the worst. Um, they were given the, the worst types of jobs. Most of them probably didn't have jobs at all but were either in uh, indentured servitude or slavery or extreme forms of poverty and things like this. Now, uh, officially, the fifth caste has been uh, removed, right, because of the, just the horrible injustices that these individuals faced. But there's still such a stigma attached to it that uh, people will not, even today, will not admit if their lineage or family members were a part of the untouchables caste even so much to the extent that they have, you know, tried to offer scholarships to help make up for a lot of the, um, you know, systemic injustices that the untouchables faced. But you have to admit that you were an untouchable to gain these scholarships and people are not even willing to put it down on paper. So, right, just to give you a sense of, of what these, um, how deeply this caste system remains, right, even though it's not officially part of the uh, Indian political structure anymore, it still has a very prominent place in society, 
right? A lot of people might still um, insist on only marrying people that are in the same caste, things like this. So it wasn't something that just determined your social status, but of course, also your religious status, right? So how close you were to achieving enlightenment, to achieving moksha, would be determined by the caste that you were born into. And this is something you were born into. And it's, uh, as we'll learn in the Bhagavad Gita, it has to do with the karma that you accumulated in your past life. And because of that karma, the idea was that you would have certain forces ruling over your soul, your Atman, right? And specifically, these three forces are known as Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas, okay? So Sattva is the guna of knowledge and light. Rajas is the guna of action and passion. And Tamas is the guna or force of ignorance and laziness, which is kind of ironic because as you'll see, the individuals who are believed to be ruled by Tamas are given jobs in manual labor, right? Service providers. Now you'll notice on the right here that next to Tamas and ignorance um, is women. And so even though women could be born into families of any of these four castes, if you are born as a woman, it is believed that your soul is ruled over by Thomas or ignorance. And so you might be able to benefit from the fact that your family is a Vaishya, a Kshatriya, or Brahmin, but you yourself as a woman are a Shudra, right, in your soul. So men can be born into any of the castes. Women can be born into families of any of the castes and thus would marry men of that same caste, but women themselves are all considered the lowest possible class in the caste system. And this has manifested in a lot of different uh, problems, but some of the, I think, most interesting ones that are still, you know, in being practiced today is that if you are a single woman, right, so you haven't married a man of, of a caste that is, you know, the same as your family or higher, then you might be charged more for rent than someone else because it is automatically presumed that you are untrustworthy, right? And so the idea is that this guna or force doesn't just determine your social status or religious status, it can determine your entire life, right? Your job, your occupation. And that's because the idea was whatever force is ruling over your soul will mean that you will have a certain set of skills, right? So if you're more inclined to ignorance or the passions or knowledge, right, you're gonna be better suited for certain types of jobs. And so that's the, the middle section of this chart here, your varna or class, right? Depending on what uh, caste you're born into, right? That will determine what level of society you'll enter and what kind of jobs will be available to you. Okay, another thing to mention is that um, there are discussions of the four stages of life in Hinduism. Not surprisingly, these are only for men, right? And the idea is that you move from being a student, being single, to being a member of the household, to being a recluse, right? So the idea is that you study, you engage in family life, but then as you end your life and you hopefully are accumulating better and better karma, you will actually separate yourself from your family and then eventually from society as a whole, entering the sannyasa stage or becoming a monk. All right, so there's more here about death and rebirth. So please take a look at that as well as moksha. Um, so there is one thing I wanna mention on this slide here. So related to the caste system, right? Just as there are going to be certain types of jobs that are going to be seen as appropriate depending on which force or guna is ruling over your soul. Similarly, there is a certain path to moksha, path to the divine, that is going to be seen as appropriate for you, right? And so the Vedas, given that those uh, those texts were really focused on rituals, are they advocate for the path of karma marga, or the path of ritual action. And this is going to be something that is going to be most appropriate for the second caste, right, which is ruled over by Rajas and Thomas. 
The Upanishads, those philosophical questions at the end of the Vedas, of course, are going to be associated more with knowledge, right? Answering those philosophical questions. And so that those texts tend to advocate for a path known as Janana Marga, the path of knowledge. And this, right, intuitively is reserved for the Brahmin caste, right? The very highest caste. The Bhagavad Gita is going to be advocating more for um, what is known as Bhakti Marga, which is the path of action, right? And so this is going to be in the story that we're going to discuss in a moment with the Bhagavad Gita. It has to do with Krishna being a warrior, right? So it's about how to deal with moral dilemmas in one's life, right? So we have rituals, knowledge, action, and then we have the sutras, which is um, the later text, which is for, you know, perhaps the shudras, people who don't have the knowledge to go about um, you know, gaining the, or following the path, the Janana Marga path. Um, maybe they don't even have enough access to do the ritual practice, right? That might require certain resources. Bhakti Marga is about, again, doing certain action in this case with all of the fruits of that action going towards God. And so Yoga Marga is something that is a little bit more passive, right? Something that we can embody in in our everyday lives. But the idea is that every single one of these paths is seen as being appropriate for someone's, depending on which caste you're born into. Okay, so there's a few more comparisons here if you want to uh, take a note of them between uh, terminology that's used in the Vedic texts as we move into the pre-epic period for the Upanishads, and then a little bit about um, how Hinduism looks today. So I'm going to pause here and then I'll come back to do the second part of this lecture, which is going to focus on the Bhagavad Gita.